good evening and thank you for that introduction, uh, Matthew. So thank you for listening in tonight. Um, so when it comes to the question of why do Christians take bread and wine, um, it, may, it may seem like a strange concept at first that uh, once a week we all gather together, or albeit virtually at the moment, and take a small bit of bread and a sip of wine. Um, however, I believe that this question can be answered uh, very simply by reading what is recorded for us the first time bread and wine was shared in the same way we do today. This was, of course, during the Last Supper, just before Jesus was crucified. So I would like to begin tonight's talk by looking at each of the gospel records of the Last Supper, and as each writer records slightly different information, uh, we'll be starting off in Mark, but it's only when you put all the messages together does it really begin to make sense. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll be starting off in Mark's gospel, chapter 14 and starting at verse 22, uh, which reads, As they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and break it and gave to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my body blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will no more drink of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So there isn't much of an explanation here why they are doing what they are doing. However, there is that little phrase in there, um, shed for many. So the purpose of what they're doing isn't just for the 12 disciples in the room, Jesus it is for many people so okay with that in mind let's take a look at the same account recorded for us in Matthew's gospel and see what that says so that's Matthew 26 starting verse 26 and when and as they were eating Jesus took the bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to his disciples and said take eat this is my body and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will no, not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In those verses, they may seem almost identical at first glance, but um, there is a bit more of an explanation why they are sharing bread and wine. In verse 28, there is a phrase, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The for the remission of sins is missing in Mark's gospel. So they are doing what they are doing for the remission or cancelling of their sins. And again, it says Jesus' blood will be shed for many, not just for the people sat in that room. Great. So let's now take a look at Luke's gospel in chapter 22 and see what information that says for us. That's uh, Luke 22, starting at verse 17. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given, given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after, <clears throat> excuse me, after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So it's not until here in Luke's gospel that we see a commandment associated with taking the bread and wine. Jesus here says here to his disciples that they are to do this, being the taking of bread and wine, in remembrance of him. So after Jesus has died, followers of him are to share bread and wine together as a method of remembering his death. This point is brought up further in the book of the Corinthians, um, is the passage we had for our introductory reading. Uh, reading. For a little context, this letter was written by Paul through inspiration to the Ecclesia in Corinth, 
as this ecclesia had a few problems and Paul wrote to them to um, give them some instruction and in how they should be go at their worship. And Paul again recounts that Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper, but puts more of an emphasis on doing this in remembrance. As it is mentioned twice in the first book of Corinthians, chapter 11, uh, starting at verse 24. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. We see here that it is mentioned twice that we should do this in remembrance of him. Now, I appreciate that I've just read seemingly uh, four very similar passages. However, each one contains a slightly different message, and it is an example why it is important for us to look at the whole of Scripture and compare it like for like, as we can get so much more if and we can so much more can be gained from it if we do it that way. So, if we do that here, we can answer the question of why do Christians take bread and wine? Uh, from Mark, we learned that Jesus shed his blood for many people. And from this, it is implied that Jesus wasn't just, um, that what Jesus was saying wasn't just for the Jews or the Gentiles. It was for everyone, including you and I. Uh, from Matthew, we learned that Jesus shed his blood for the remission and or the forgiveness of sins. From Luke and the letter to the Corinthians, we learned that we should take bread and wine in remembrance of what was done for us. So at a very basic level, that answers our question for tonight. Jesus died so that many people can have their sins forgiven, but we should take bread and wine as a method of remembering what was done for us. But I would like to take this concept a little bit further tonight. So you may have noticed that there was a little phrase mentioned in pretty much all of the verses that I've read so far, but haven't paid much attention to it. And that is the bit where it mentions something along the lines of, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying here that he will not drink of the fruit of the vine until he drinks it in the kingdom of God. Now, those unfamiliar with the life, teachings and resurrection of Jesus may get a little confused by this, as it raises some questions such as, what is the kingdom of God? And as Jesus was about to die, how would he take um, the fruit of the vine again before his death? So if we start by answering the first question, as I believe that sets us on the right tracks to answering the second. So what is the kingdom of God? This is a subject that is spoken about extensively throughout the Old Testament and the New. It speaks of a time where Jesus shall return to the earth, Israel shall be restored and shall be the capital of that kingdom. Jesus is to be the king of this kingdom uh, and the government in this kingdom are to be the faithful believers or the saints, both past and present. So there is to be a resurrection of past faithful believers and all saints will be immortal. Let's now look at a few verses that back this up. So Jesus will return to the earth. One of the many places it tells us this is the book of Acts in chapter one. So if we could turn there now, please. Um, this chapter is set shortly after Jesus has risen from the dead on the third day. So that's Acts chapter one, and we'll be starting off at verse nine. And when he had spoken these things, while well, they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. 
So Jesus here has risen up into heaven after he has been crucified and risen from the dead. And two angels who were there said to Jesus' disciples, why are you standing gazing into heaven? Jesus will return to the earth again, um, the same way you have seen him go. So we can see here that Jesus is going to return to the earth at some point. So what is going to happen when he returns to the earth? This question is answered for us in the Old Testament in the second book of Samuel in chapter 7. To give you a bit of context here before we read this passage, God is making some promises to David. He promises that in David's family line, there will be a seed who will be established in the throne of the kingdom of God forever. So that's 2 Samuel 7, starting at verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, and I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. Verse 14 here confirms for us that this seed who will rule in the kingdom of God will be Jesus, as he is the only person who can be called the Son of God. So, so far we have covered that in the kingdom of God, Jesus will return to the earth and he will be the ruler of that kingdom. Okay, great. So what does this have to do with you and I? As I mentioned before, the faithful believers will be the government in this kingdom. Uh, this concept is outlined for us in the book of Revelation in chapter 5 and verse 10. So that's Revelation 5 and verse 10. Here it says, talking about the saints or faithful believers, um, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. But when the faithful believers are to be the government, in this kingdom, they aren't just going to be normal people. In perhaps the most well-known verse in the whole of the Bible, John chapter 3 and verse 16, it tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So whoever believes in Jesus is to have ever, everlasting life. So in this kingdom, all the current faithful believers on the planet and all of the faithful believers in the past will be raised from the dead and will live forever as kings and priests in the kingdom of God under the reign of Jesus. What a time this is to look forward to. Um, I believe this, albeit very brief summary of the kingdom of God, answers the two questions I raised earlier. What is the kingdom of God? And how could Jesus take the bread and wine after his death? The kingdom of God is a future kingdom to be set up on earth. And Jesus, who was raised on the third day after he was crucified, will return to the earth and be a ruler in this kingdom. And it's this time that Jesus is referring to when he addresses his, in this, his disciples at the time of the Last Supper. I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So taking bread and wine for Christians is more than just a method of remembering Jesus's sacrifice, but there's a huge amount of symbology behind it. It is a way of looking forward to a time that we all long for, looking forward to the time where Jesus will return to the earth to undo the wrong done by man and set up the kingdom of God. So while we are on the subject of symbology, Jesus at the Last Supper tells us what each of the bread and the wine represents. He says, take this bread for it is my body and take this wine for it is my blood. What is the significance of this? So we are given the following passage in Hebrews and chapter 10. Again, to give you a bit of context before we read this. One of the main purposes of Jesus's ministry was to bring in a new law of which followers of him should abide by. 
the previous law, which we call the law of Moses, worked on the basis that every time you commit a sin, you have to get that sin forgiven by God, you would have to offer a sacrifice. However, as humans are imperfect, and the fact that you give, if you give each of us long enough, we will sin. This law was unsustainable. However, Jesus, the only perfect human, came along and beat that law. He never sinned. So now everyone who lives after Jesus doesn't have to offer sacrifices to get their sins forgiven. Jesus, is sacrificed, um, Jesus sacrificed himself so that we don't have to and we can get our sins forgiven through him. And this is what it is talking about in Hebrews 10. So if we start at verse 10, we read, By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. For every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice, for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And this is some of the deeper symbology behind the bread representing Jesus's body. As we have just read in those verses, that we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So, if that is what, um, so if that is what the bread being Jesus's body represents, that's Jesus's that Jesus's one sacrifice is cover one sacrifice covers all of our sins. So, what does the wine representing Jesus's blood mean? When we look through verses in the Bible that mention Jesus's blood, including the ones we have read tonight, very often the theme is that Jesus's blood was shed for the remission or the forgiveness of our sins. It is mentioned at the Last Supper, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. Uh, we shan't turn there now, but in, the first, um, in 1 John 1 verse 7, we read that if we walk in light as he, Jesus, is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. We also read in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 that from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glorified, glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. So when we look at the meaning behind Jesus' blood in Scripture, it is very often referring to the forgiveness of our sins, which makes sense as Paul writes, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. As in the Old Testament, they would have to offer animal sacrifices. And in the New Testament, we can have our sins forgiven through the shedding of Jesus's blood. You may be surprised to know that throughout the Old Testament, there are several references to the taking of bread and wine. Thousands of years prior to the Last Supper taking place, I believe this is God's way of foreshadowing what was to come and in turn can reassure us in the infallibility of what the Bible says. As different people, thousands of years apart, made the same references to the taking of the bread and wine. The first Old Testament uh, reference to the bread and wine that I'd like us to turn to is way back in the book of Genesis. This chapter refers to a man who was both a king and a priest of Salem. And the similarities between this chapter and the ministry and future reign of Jesus is staggering. 
We shall read together verses 18 to 20 of Genesis 14. So that's Genesis 14, starting at verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. He And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. The points I would like us to note from this small passage um, is, obviously, Melchizedek shared bread and wine with Abraham. Uh, Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Uh, Melchizedek was king of Salem, which is early Jerusalem. Uh, Melchizedek means, Melchizedek's name means my king of justice. This is clearly pointing forward to Jesus. Jesus instigated the taking of bread and wine with his followers. Jesus is the only other person in the rest of the Bible who is named a king and a priest. Jesus is going to be the future king of Jerusalem or Salem. And Jesus is going to be the king of justice. As I said before, this is clearly foreshadowing the life, resurrection and return of Jesus and should give us confidence and assurance in what the Bible, in confidence and assurance in what the Bible says and why we do what we do. So to summarise what I have said tonight and to answer the question of why do Christians take the bread and wine, we started off by examining and interpreting what Jesus said when he instituted the taking of bread and wine in the upper room during the Last Supper. He stated that his blood would be shed for many people. He said that he shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. He then commanded that his disciples are to take bread and wine as a method of remembering what was done for them. We then went on to discuss what Jesus meant when he said that he will not take bread and wine again until he drinks it new in the kingdom of God. Uh, The kingdom of God being a future kingdom to be set up on earth where Jesus is to rule and the faithful believers will be um, immortal as kings and priests. This being another reason why Christians take bread and wine as it is imitating what will take place in the kingdom of God. We then went on to discuss the symbology uh, of bread representing Jesus's body and wine representing Jesus's blood. And finally, we looked at the time where taking of bread and wine was foreshadowed in the Old Testament by Melchizedek, which demonstrated the continuity and infallibility of the Bible. So I hope that answers the question of why do Christians take bread and wine? Uh, Thank you. Thank you.